Welcome to MarcusG.TV. I'm Chef Marcus Giuliano. I'm a chef on a mission. Today's mission is a is questions. Questions from Yolanda Ramirez, who is in a culinary school near Schenectady. And I love having my videos and I love working with students. I used to be an adjunct teacher at uh, Sullivan County Community College in their professional chef program. Um, I really enjoy the aspect of working with students and teaching. And I get a lot of emails from uh, professors and teachers from across the country that want to use my videos for their, their classes. And I say absolutely 100% any video I have um, that you may find of interest that you can share, please use it in your classroom. So I'm, if there's any culinary teachers out there, you can use any of my videos. Feel free to, don't even ask me, just, uh, just uh, start using them away. I have a lot of videos on the ethics of food, food production, uh, business. I have a ton of business videos, an immense amount of video, video business. Business videos, you can go to at 50mistakes.com and find all those, a bunch of marketing, things like that. So, Yolanda Ramirez came down and visited me personally, and then she, has some qu she had some questions that I answered in person, and I want to uh, just answer these on the camera as well. So, um... What is your title and what do you do? Question number one. So my name is Chef Marcus Giuliano. I own and operate a restaurant 90 miles north of New York City called Aroma Time Bistro. I do do some cooking. I do a lot of marketing. I do a lot of behind the scenes. I kind of do everything. I'm, I'm basically the owner and my wife and I both run it together. This is our full-time job. This is our mission. This is our passion. We love what we do in this small town. We've been here 13 years. We opened in 2003. Why did I choose this career? That's a good question. Um, I've always had a passion for cooking. I've always had a passion for eating. Growing up in an Italian family, uh, food is the focal point of, of all of your meals. And I can remember when I was as little as five years old helping my grandmother make fresh pasta. Uh, her garden was immense and the things that she grew in there. And I mean, when it was fall, you had to harvest all the tomatoes and package in them or jar them for the winter time. And, and there had a wine cellar in the basement. My grandfather at one point made homemade wine. Uh, so food was really something that you took uh, you took very personal. And as a young kid growing up, I never ever ever had a TV dinner. Never we never bought my mom, my mom never bought anything frozen. It was always you want dinner, you make it. We never went out to eat as a kid. It was dinners here and dinners being made. So I guess that aspect of wanting a des having a desire to cook or being able to cook or being around it just led me down this path. My first year in college, I was reading a cookbook more than I was reading my accounting book, although I'm glad I took uh, the two accounting courses my first two semesters because those are extremely important in the kitchen, in owning a restaurant. And I tell people, you know, yes, I've been an executive chef in places, but it seems more like an executive um, kitchen accountant is really the job because when you get a job as executive chef you are the person where you have to maintain not only the quality and 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 the team and the food going out but you also have to maintain behind the scenes the numbers projections numbers budgets and that's a whole nother realm that most chefs really don't understand and uh, I'm always consider myself a restaurateur and really not a chef as much. I'm a, I am love to cook and I am a chef and I've been the executive chef of several country clubs and restaurants, but I've always said, you know what, I'm a restaurateur. I'm a chef with a business mind, thus being a restaurateur, business owner, an entrepreneur. Why did you choose the location of your restaurant in Ellenville? And what have been the re and uh, have the results from being at your location met your expectations? So I'm in Ellenville, New York. It's a small community, 90 miles north of New York City. The population is about 4,500 here. We used to have big industry. We used to have Channel Master, uh, which employed a thousand people or so. Uh, that was a Resnick's business. If you watch TV up until the mid 80s. Uh, at your house and you had an antenna on your roof, it came from Channel Master, it got produced right here in Ellenville. They were the global leader, they were the national leader of making antennas. That was made right here in Ellenville. We also had a company called Schrade. Schrade was uh, a cutlery company, knife cut, cut knife company, very famous knife company here in America. All knives are made in America until G in the early 2000s, I believe. Uh, we had a, a booming hotel business, the Falls View and the Neville. 
And we also had another company called Hydro Aluminum, uh, VAW, Hydro Aluminum. So Ellenville was a tourist destination and it was um, had a lot of jobs. Well, when we first opened in 2003, by 2005, 2006, all of those places had dried up and shut down and closed. Channel Masters had actually moved in the 80s. Uh, they moved down south and that was it. We also had small clothing manufacturers here like Devil Dog Dungarees. They were here they were right down the block here. Um, they employed a lot of people. So all of these businesses basically dried up except for uh, the Fallsview Hotel, which is now the Honor Haven, which is, I think, a 250-room, 300-room resort. Uh, but prior to that, the Neville was a 462-room resort with 450 employees. And all the other places had another 1,500 employees, 1,000 employees here in the village. And all those dried up. So quickly we learned that, hey, you know, a lot of our guests that were eating with us were the management and, uh, and guests coming into town, visiting the town through the hotels. And that soon, soon dissipated. So, you know, Ellenville has, sort, in a sort of extent, met our expectations. I think when my wife and I opened Aroma Time, we were very naive, and which is good. You need a bit of, uh, you need to be naive when you open up a business to a certain extent, because if you analyze too much and you put it to paper too much, you'll talk yourself out of most things, right? Um, because you say, oh my gosh, the odds are too high and this and that. And so we were like, oh, we can do this. We can do this. We can do this. And I think a lot of restaurant owners feel the same way. Like, oh yeah, I don't care what the numbers say. I mean, I'm very numbers driven as well. So I, I wrote out a budget when I, especially when I went, had to go for funding, I wrote out a zero based budget that uh, was very entailed. And I was actually on projection to my budget as far as sales, sales, but the expenses, you know, the expenses just all of a sudden eat you up. Um, we didn't open with much money in Aroma Time. We opened up with $50,000 and then another $25,000 loan. So $75,000 is what we took to open our restaurant in 2003. Currently, I stock about forty dollars to $50,000 in liquor inventory every month. We have a lot of fine wines, a lot of fine beers, and the inventory adds up. So when we first opened, we didn't have the luxury of just going and stocking up on all this stuff. It was a slow progression. You know, we needed a new air conditioner. We bought one new air conditioner and we were very, very wise with how we spent our money. Uh, we wanted to build the wine list. We bought one or two new titles and it wasn't a massive big purchase at one time. We needed new kitchen equipment. We figured out which kitchen equipment we needed the most. And we bought one oven, you know, and it took a while, you know, 12 years into it, 13 years ago, this, just this year, matter of fact, in 2016, I replaced all of my kitchen refrigeration. This was the original refrigeration that was here in 2003. So I basically said, this stuff is old. It's not as efficient anymore. But I didn't have the luxury of buying stuff like that seven years ago. And I just replaced every single piece in the kitchen. I said, that's it. Three years ago, we bought our first walk-in cooler, which totally, totally revamped the way we, uh, the way we purchase and the way we buy and, and the way we store totally because we were using all these reach-in coolers. But we didn't have all these reach-in coolers when we first opened either. We were actually storing stuff inside of a beer keg cooler, uh, which was a small short walk-in. Uh, when we first opened, we served Pepsi products or Coke products, one or the other. We don't haven't served those in years. But they gave us a refrigerator at the bar, and I took half of my food at the end of the night to the bar refrigerator. So it's this very slow progression of how to build a business. A lot of people jump into it with a million dollars, a half a million dollars, which is great, and do things right from day one. And I wished I was in that luxury, but I learned, you know, I learned the hard way, and I had to grow a business from basically nothing. Um, so Ellenville has met our expectations. You know, every year we, we increase our sales more and more and more. Um, you know, I'm at a restaurant that does about eight hundred nine, eight to nine hundred thousand dollars a year in sales. I would love to be doing one point two million, one point five million. I feel those are really awesome numbers to have a restaurant and be very profitable. Am I profitable at eight and nine hundred thousand? I am. But you know, you still have times of the year, and any restaurant will tell you. I belong to a mastermind group. Any restaurant tour will tell you that, man, there's times of the year, if you, even if you're doing $2 million, there's times of the year where you're just struggling to pay bills because of cash flow, because of because all of a sudden you're in between seasons or you're in an off season and you go from doing, a, I have one friend who goes from doing $100,000 a week in sales in the summertime to basically like five or $6,000, $7,000 a week. And to manage you know, a staff of 100 full-time employees 
in seasonal to all of a sudden then going down to a staff of 15 is a major challenge. So, and you know, just because you're doing all these numbers doesn't mean that you haven't made. And I think a lot of outsiders looking in at restaurant tours, they say, oh, he drives a nice car, his restaurant's busy, you know, look how packed he is. The guy, this guy must be rolling in it. This guy must be killing it, crushing it financially. And that's <laughs> very rarely is that the case. Uh, this is a passion business. And I tell anybody who ever wants to invest in, in the restaurant business, because a lot of people say, oh, I want to you know, invest in somebody, this and that. I said, do not expect to get your money back. You're doing it because you want to be part of a restaurant. You're not doing it because you think you're going to get 10, 15% back or whatever you're going to get back on your investment. That's not the case. Restaurant, A restaurant is a very, very, very high risk investment, a high risk business. And that just means as a restaurateur, you have to work that much harder to make your business successful, which in the beginning, Jamie and I, the first couple of years, I mean, we busted our butts every single day. I cooked on the line every single day. And my wife still bartends all the time. She still works the floor. I still float on the floor. I float in the kitchen. Um, but the first four years, I was stuck in the kitchen. I was chained to the oven. If I wasn't at the oven cooking, the restaurant wouldn't have been open that night. And that's not a good feeling. So I learned how... Uh, when I saw what other friends were doing, how to delegate, how to train staff, how to build staff, how to be able to walk away from your business. Now my wife and I travel every other month, usually to a conference of some sort. We just got back from Charleston, took the kids to Italy last year for 12 days. It's our second trip to Italy since we've opened the restaurant. Um, so you just have to learn how to break away and, and build a restaurant that's sustainable. Uh, we're, we're sustainable, I mean by you can walk away that day, that weekend, and the restaurant still is running without you. Um, what was your inspiration behind Aroma Time Bistro? My inspiration for the restaurant was basically that I wanted to cook food that I could eat personally. Um, I have a diet, I don't have weird dietary habits, but I'm conscious of what I eat. My wife, my wife and I are very conscious of what I eat and we became that way when we had our daughter 17 years ago. I said, I've screwed my life up so much. Um, I don't want to screw my kids' life up, so let's start educating and researching on foods. And once the more I researched on where our food comes from, and as a young chef, I would always wonder how a 18-wheeler can just be sitting outside every single morning unloading the same size filet mignons, the same size pork tenderloins, the same size this, the same size, just an endless supply. I'm thinking to myself, where does this come from? Where does all this come from? And so I started researching how food is grown and produced. And when you meet farmers that won't eat their own foods because of the chemicals they spray on it, but they do it because they have to, because they're in business to make money. They're not in business to eat their own food. They eat food from their neighbor who does organic. And this is a true story. I met a potato farmer who wouldn't eat his own potatoes. So it made me really wonder like, whoa. So as this progression happened, I became more in tuned to vegetarian food, to vegetarian cooking, and realized that a vegetarian and a meat eater had a very hard time going out to the same restaurant together. One person would say, well, no, we're going vegetarian tonight, just pretend those soaked walnuts are chicken nuggets. And then you'd go to a steakhouse or you go to a regular restaurant, by the way, just a regular restaurant, to get a veg vegetarian food was very, very challenging, well thought out vegetarian food. I mean, a lot of places will do steamed vegetables and a baked potato or pasta and, and with some vegetables and sauce. That's just, I feel it's a betrayal to the customer and a betrayal to the vegetarian cuisine. If you're a restaurant, maybe besides the steakhouse, but if you're a restaurant, it, it, most restaurants, chefs show preferences towards towards animal-based proteins, fish-based proteins. They really forget all about, you know, the quinoa, the beans, the tofu, the seitan, the tempeh, all these other cool things, the rices, the different grains, that they could make a nice, nice, really nice vegetarian meal. So I said, I'm gonna change that. I wanna have, you know, a third of my entrees to be the very thoughtful vegetarian entrees. And you look at my menu now, and yeah, about 40% of my, my food is vegetarian entrees. We do grass-fed steaks, we do local local beef for our burgers, we have sustainable seafood, we have all these other things, but I'm not cooking with all these extra beef stocks and veal stocks and chicken stocks. It's a, it's a matter of making food pure, using real ingredients, and honoring both carnivores and vegetarians at the same time, so they both have a great experience. So that was the whole really premise of, hey, I want to be able to go out to eat. If I, if I had my own ideal restaurant where I could take friends and where I could eat personally, where I knew where the food was coming from, this is what I'm going to make, and this is what I, this is how Aroma Time is. I want, I want good wine. I want to feel good about about the food I'm eating. I want to feel good about the people that we're supporting in the community. I want to feel good about the farm that we're supporting, whether it's in our community or in California or it's a small family-run winery in Italy. Um, so it's all about the connections. I mean, 50 years ago, you, you bought upon relationships. 100 years ago, it was relationship, relationship, relationship. And, and we've lost 
the business world has lost that allure of the relationship business. And uh, you know, for us, it's super important to know where our food comes from. And even like our salesperson, if I don't like my salesperson, I'm not gonna buy from that company. I don't care what that company has, I'll call and ask for a new salesperson. And I've done that many times because I wanna feel good about the people that, that we're supporting. Keeping in mind the altruistic principles your restaurant is built on, what advice would you give someone who is trying to open a bakery or breakfast cafe if he or she doesn't have the capital to open a, to open a restaurant immediately? Oh, wow. You know, capital is always the biggest thing. Um, always the biggest thing. Now, having an altruistic approach basically means that you're devoted to um, principles, sustainability, the welfare of others, okay? So um, you're very concerned about the environment, you're concerned about others, you're concerned about sustainability, about humane you know, food, socially responsible food. Now all of a sudden you wanna open a place. How do you do it on a low, low budget? Well, I think I explained that a little earlier. I did do it on a very low, low budget. I built the restaurant, I worked very hard, and I was willing to work every single day to make this work, and I was naive. Um, and the biggest thing along the way is my wife and I would get presented with obstacles like, man, um, if we just served Budweiser, we'd be busier. We'd make more profit margin. But then we look at each other and say, but that's not our principles. Our principles is not serving big brands where a CEO is buying a fourth vacation home and we're, we're contributing that. We want to support an independent producer in a real community with uh, making real jobs in a real brewery, a real distillery, a real winery, a real farm, real distributorship. That's what we want to support. And you know, over the years, we're just like, man, it would just be easier if we just served, you know, cheap food or this or that. And and we look at each other and go, that's not us. That's totally not us. We want to feel good about what we're serving. We want to feel good about what we're eating personally. Um, so you know, if you have no money, if you or if you have very lack of capital, the main thing here is to get experience, 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 experience. If you're good and you go work at places, you'll quickly move up the ranks, and people will see that you're good. Now, if you now. A lot of restaurateurs, a lot, a lot of restaurants have several locations and they're always looking for good staff. If I had an employee that came to me and said, or worked with me for two, three, four years and totally kicked butt, and I'm an option now to either say, I'm gonna lose this employee because he's gonna go work somewhere else or he's gonna go open his own place. And I've lost employees that have opened their own places before. But I would see it as a business owner now, well, how can I help that person get into a restaurant? How can I go in a partnership with them? How can we figure out how to get money to walk into a good deal and do something? So you kind of want to leverage your current employee and 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 their you know their hopefully hope of of growing more. I have one friend who owns forty restaurants and he will not open a restaurant without a partner in it. And he gets his partners, um, his operating partners from his current restaurants. So he takes staff and promotes them and brings them up. These are staff that would not have a half a million dollars or three quarters of a million dollars to open their own restaurant, but because they've showed dedication to this to this restaurant tour for three, four, five years, and he knows that they're on top of it, he brings them under their wings and goes in and funds them, or they have a small part of the restaurant, but it's still part of their restaurant. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is just go out there and just, you know, start very small. Start from, you know, a small kitchen, a home kitchen if you're a bakery, uh, rented kitchens, lots of rented spaces. You can go in and rent spaces that are USDA approved, health department approved, where you can start baking cookies, you can start doing all kinds of things ASAP and you rent the kitchen out by the hour or you actually hire a co-packer to make your products if it's a brownie or something in your bakery. Start that, start the brand recognition, um, start, keep working in a place, be a personal chef. There's so many ways that you can actually get out there and get known to to people and get get investors. Uh, one way is to actually actually approach an investor and say, this is what I want to do. Um, keep in mind, you really don't want a partner. You want an investor, an investor who gives you money. You pay the investor back, but an investor who has no say in the restaurant as far as daily operations. You want to avoid somebody walking in and say, you're doing it wrong, or why don't you do this? And you want to avoid somebody who's making you crazy every single day about what you're doing. You want to get people that are investing in you because they trust you. If somebody wants to give you money and they want to control a good portion of the business or they want to be involved that much, that's not an investor for you. You want to be able to have your own talent, your own creativity, and your own freedom and your own trust levels with who's ever giving you money. My suggestion would be, you know, go to five people and get $10,000 each. 
$20,000 each from five people or 10 people, it's it's less of a burden than one person giving you 100,000 or 200,000. It's much less of a burden because that person who's giving you 200,000 probably makes much more of a difference than somebody who's giving you five or 10,000. So you wanna do like a sort of um, a, a investor team to approach that. And also crowdfunding is huge right now. Crowdfunding is massively huge. I know some restaurants who have done crowdfunding for their current operation to expand, to buy a food truck, uh, to do other things. So crowdfunding is also something to look into as well when you want to expand. Um, what would you like to leave behind as your legacy for aspiring chefs? I think my legacy, my legacy is that, you know, we're here to make a difference, chefs. Chefs have the power to to destroy the environment or to be super conscious and carry the torch forward and uh, and question everything that's being produced. We are, you know, the Food and Drug Administration doesn't protect us, the USAIDA doesn't protect us. None of these places really protect us. They protect big food corporations, big food producers, manufacturers, processors. So for me as a chef, I'm an advocate. I'm a food activist. I think activism is so important in this industry to stand up for the right thing, to serve socially responsible food, not to, to buy sugar that's not involved in slave labor, chocolate that's not involved in slave labor, shrimp that's not involved. There's so many of our foods that are produced today that involve slave labor, very unfair labor, that use nine-year-old boys in fields and don't they don't go to school. There's so many things, the more you, you, the more you research, you have to understand that everything, your, every dollar you spend as a chef impacts somebody negatively or positively. Buying quinoa, quinoa is a great food, but your most quinoa comes from South America, and the quinoa market has skyrocketed the last five and 10 years. So no longer can a small farmer or the locals, the locals, the people that work there, the people that live in these places in South America, they no longer can afford their staple food of quinoa because it's too expensive. So as a chef, you now have to say, well, how can I buy quinoa that is that's not going to have this kind of social impact, right? Or I don't buy that food at all uh, because it's that's your legacy. That's your you know that's your mission. That's my mission. Is how do I buy better foods that are better for the environment, better for the employees, better for the community, and you know and it's not only food. As a restaurant tour, it's everything we do. It's you know the the right down to the the paper goods, make sure they're biodegradable, make sure there's no styrofoam in house. I've seen so many restaurants that are still serving styrofoam. You know, we all know that styrofoam is bad for the environment. It takes 500 years to break down. If it breaks down uh, and it has chemicals in it, but there's still restaurants that are buying cheap styrofoam. And chefs need, to, chefs need to stand up and stop this. Plastic bags. Why can't we go to paper bags for takeout food? Why can't we recycle things? We save all of our glass bottles for maple syrup. We save um, our glass jugs. We give them away to people that are making jams or whatever. We save, we save corks. We save all these things that then can then be reused as opposed to being recycled. We have our own garden. Uh, we, we visit a lot of our farmers that we buy from. We visit our wineries that we buy from. We have to raise relationships. So this legacy that I'm, that I'm trying to leave is a consciousness a consciousness to, to being a food activist, activism, to saying, how do we eat well and live well and protect the environment? That's what it's about. So, you know, I want people to say, you know what? He was a true activist. And um, so that is, uh, that's my legacy. So there we go. If anybody has any questions, hit me up with some comments. I'm happy to always look for content for video. If you're a culinary student, if you're a culinary teacher and you need some resources, you need to interview me, you need to use my, my, my material, please feel free to do that. I'm Chef Marcus Giuliano. Go to my website, chefonamission.com. Check everything out over there. I got a bunch of things. And thanks for watching.